Our next speaker is actually the World Bank, uh, Maria Eugenia Bonilla Chachi. Where are you? Welcome. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. And I, I actually have quite enjoyed all the conversations and all the presentation we have had since yesterday. So what I'm going to talk about today is not on the evidence behind the interventions. We have heard a quite a very good presentation this morning. What I'm going to talk about is building the evidence of what's needed to actually implement those uh, uh, policies that we, where there is consensus, there is evidence that they work. For, sorry to pass the pointer. Yeah. And to pass the. It's, yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry. So the problem we, we have been talking about all this uh, since yesterday, uh, we, we have uh, increasing in prevalence of overweight and obesity across all the world, including a low and middle income countries. And this graph presents the trends in World Bank uh, client regions. And you see it has increased in every single one, in some more faster than the others, particularly in Eastern Europe, Central Asia. And this was what we've been talking about. I mean, although there is still the jury is there on some of the uh, interventions, what we really know is that one intervention alone won't make a difference. What we need is a comprehensive strategies, and these comprehensive strategies uh, are often have package of interventions across the life cycle. And as we have uh, talked about, this is an adaptation of the, um, uh, the interventions of the package of recommendations of the uh, report, the final report of the Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. And one thing we know, not only that we need comprehensive interventions, we also know that many of the interventions, although not all, are interventions at population level, are, po are population-based interventions. And these population-based interventions have particular features that make them difficult to, uh, to implement. Why? Uh, many of these interventions are uh, multi-sectoral in nature. These interventions, uh, it's not the health sector, the one uh, often that is in charge of implementing them. It's uh, often the health sector coordinates some of these uh, actions. But you have the retail industry, you have finance in the case of fiscal policies that we talked a lot about yesterday. A, a, uh, taxes and subsidies. Uh, we also have the agricultural sector, education, retail industry, uh, food and beverage industry. So again, these interventions have particularly challenges that make them really hard to implement, more uh, harder than any other health reform that are a, uh, health reforms that are linked to uh, a clinical interventions or, or a, a, that only involve the health sector. And some of these challenges have to do that there are often multiple and diverse stakeholders that take part in the decision-making process, but also in the implementation process and then they are scaling up. Some of these stakeholders can be quite powerful and they often have, the, they face uh, completely different interests and, and they might have uh, a diverse views on what to do and what not to do. And they might be very strong opposers to some of the interventions. There's also, in the case of, of the federal governments, uh, it's, there are several levels of government involved. Uh, there is often the federal government has to deal uh, in the centralized uh, context with the province, provincial government and also with local governments, which adds to the complexity of implementing these interventions. Uh, and as I mentioned before, often the health sector or health stakeholders are not directly involved, or at least not directly involved in their implementation. And makes it a little bit harder because you would really need a strong coordination across sectors and across agencies and stakeholders. 
And also, uh, often, the health stakeholders don't have the necessary skills to do, to implement, to uh, sometimes even to design, but they have to coordinate, they have to make alliance with other sectors. I mean, if we are talking about fiscal policies, you need to have in the same uh, table the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Economy uh, and others. And some of these uh, interventions also have impact on, on trade that you have to take into account before uh, you actually design and implement them. And not just only to, on trade, but in other high-level policies and that you have to take into account. So given all this complexity, uh, the, there is not so much work, there is some, uh, on what is actually needed to overcome all these challenges. What the few countries that have tried to implement some of these strategies or some particular policies have done to overcome the challenges and what, what made these uh, uh, policies uh, happen. And so this is what we're trying to work now. We have started working, we have started a program to try to understand what is needed to implement, to design, because some of them also have a very difficult uh, decision-making process. Think of a, of a fiscal policy, of a tax to, um, uh, to sugar, sweet, and beverages, where you have very strong opponents and a strong lobbies against. So how do you go about uh, overcoming those challenges and being able to uh, enact the policy? And also, for those policies that are already enacted, how, to make, how do you make sure that they are implemented and, if possible, scale up? So this is what we're trying to do now. We're trying to build the evidence of what is needed. And how are we going about it? Well, the challenge is there. Uh, okay, so how, what exactly is needed? Not that many countries in any case, or particularly not um, middle and low income countries have a comprehensive strategy. Some do. So what we're trying to do is to learn from those. And what we're trying to learn is, and the idea behind it, the goal behind it, is that we could eventually help countries uh, contribute to their efforts, uh, the countries that uh, are uh, in the process of building these strategies. And so how, uh, learning from the experience of other countries, how we can actually support it. And it's also an internal uh, a bank work on trying to understand on our different um, uh, tools that we normally have to, uh, to help to support countries, which are the better uh, um, which are the better tools to support these multi-sectoral efforts. Because in principle, the World Bank is also a multi-sectoral uh, institute, but agency, but we often don't work in a multi-sectoral way. So the idea is trying to understand how we can actually do, at least for uh, in supporting in obesity prevention uh, uh, policies. And what is the approach we're following? Uh, well, what we're trying to do is, again, as I mentioned, to learn from countries that, have, uh, that are trying to do it. And so what we're going uh, uh, what we're trying to do is to get uh, detailed case studies on uh, the few countries that are World Bank client countries that are trying to do something. And what we're trying to do is just to identify the key stakeholders in the decision-making process, the stakeholders in the implementation of some of these strategies or some particular policies. We're trying to look at what incentive each stakeholder faces, uh, the strategies they use both to support the policy or to oppose them, and then understand the factors that facilitated or hindered the process, uh, whether there were governance structures that supported, a particular leadership that supported, what? What exactly made them possible? And uh, how are we going to measure success is whether or not we can actually extract lessons and disseminate them. And so just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do, this was previous work. This was uh, work done before that more or less have the same objective, and this is work done in Latin America. This was work that was done with the aim of uh, understanding uh, what made some policies to prevent uh, risk factors for chronic conditions, not, not necessarily for obesity. And we look at several experiences in Latin America on tobacco control, on improving diet, on uh, improving physical activity, and, and others. And so this was one of the, uh, of the policies that we look at closely. And this was mentioned yesterday by Alejandro. This was a policy in, in 2010. This was a regulation of what children could 
could eat in school in Mexico. This was one of the first regulations in Latin America, and after that it has been copied in many other countries. So basically, this was a joint effort from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. But this was not an isolated policy. This was a policy that was taken in the context of a major uh, agreement uh, for the improvement of food health in Mexico. And this was a major agreement between different sectors within the government and with the private sector. And from all those uh, large framework agreements, one of the most uh, successful policies was this regulation. Although uh, we, yesterday we heard that they have been having trouble implementing it. But in any case, this regulation aimed at a basically taking all junk food from, uh, from schools in Mexico. And what we knew about this, uh, what we look at this uh, regulation is who participated in the whole decision-making process. As I mentioned, this was led by both the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health, uh, the both secretaries who worked very closely with the support of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, which basically helped design the policy. Uh, but uh, once the, the two uh, agencies got together and come up with the regulation, they have to put it to public opinion. And this was managed, uh, this was coordinated by the Minister of Finance. During this open discussion, they received tons and tons of, uh, of comments and a lot of pressure to eliminate it. And there were a lot of stakeholders involved. The, the food industry was a, a big opposer, and particularly the chambers uh, of commerce. Um, the research institutes uh, supported the effort because eventually the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education have to uh, collaborate with a lot of research institutes to support uh, their, their claims. And then the pa Parent Teacher Association had a kind of a lukewarm uh, a reaction because many of the schools, uh, many of the stores in the school that sell food were actually run by Parent Teacher Association. And they, uh, and this is not only uh, common in Mexico, it's quite common in Latin America. The Parent Teacher Association collect money from selling food and then they reinvest, uh, reinv uh, reinvest these resources in the schools. So, so many of them claim, uh, okay, we're gonna lose part of our resources that we actually invest in the school. So this, this was one of the issues. And so we look at, this is just a, a, a a very simplified version of the entire discussion, but we look at what were the um, the point of view of each, what were the arguments brought about by each of the uh, stakeholders. And this is a simplified version of what the food and beverage industry uh, mentioned and what the health and education ministries uh, mentioned. Uh, for instance, uh, a the food industry mentioned that there will be disproportionately uh, uh, there will be a disproportionately impact economic impact on them, and then the Ministry of Health uh, uh, jointly with some universities in Mexico did simulations trying to prove that that was not the case. Another, uh, which is not mentioned there, but I was discussing this yesterday with uh, with, with some of you, is that one of the things that the food industry mentioned is how can you take a uh, um, sugar sweetened beverages from the schools when they don't even, most of the schools don't even have a, a portable water, filters, uh, fountains of water. So there was a lot of discussions going on there. And uh, another thing that I, I not mentioned there, but it was also discussed is that the food industry mentioned, how can you do this in isolation when you are not doing anything against physical activity? So there was all this discussion going back and forth. Uh, we also look at, although it's not there, of what each uh, agency did to overcome many of these uh, uh, challenges. And then these are other two policies that we also look at. Like I mentioned, some of these policies were not necessarily policies to prevent obesity. These were policies to improve diets in general. And so one, it was, uh, but it can give you a sense because many of these uh, uh, policies could also uh, uh, be relevant for um, 
obesity prevention, and particularly on food reformulation. In the case of Argentina, the food reformulation was agreements to reduce sodium in processed foods, and also a regulation to ban trans fats in processed foods. The agreements to reduce sodium in processed foods eventually became a law. And I forgot to mention the regulation in Mexico, right now, uh, uh, what the children can eat at the school, have a constitutional level. Uh, it's a law at constitutional level, so the highest law uh, in the country. And in the case of Argentina, this was a major process. This was led by the Ministry of Health. But the Ministry of Health ally itself with the Ministry of Trade, with the Min of Ministry of Finance, uh, with the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Uh, and. Uh, and also the retail industry. In another policy that we talk about a lot yesterday is the fiscal policies, the taxes to sugar sweetened beverages and junk food in Mexico. This was, and, and I think Alejandro, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because Alejandro talked a bit about that yesterday, but in there, uh, there was also a strong opposers and but also strong supporters and civil society organization was one of them. Uh, but also you have a, a uh, finance minister was a, a strong supporter because the, these taxes were part of a major fiscal reform in Mexico. They were also not taken in isolation. Not only were they part of a major fiscal reform, but also part of the Mexican strategy to uh, uh, prevent obesity and overweight in the country. So going quickly to what happened in Argentina, uh, in the case of, uh, the, case of uh, the discussions for the regulation for trans fat were a little bit easier in the sense that most of the industry had already started a process to change their technology and reduce trans fat. That was not the case with sodium. Uh, with sodium, it was, uh, the discussions were a little bit more difficult. Why? Because sodium not only add taste, or at least uh, uh, the argument of the industry is not only add taste, but also it's a preservant, it's a food preservant, and it, there, were, there is not that uh, many um, substitutes for sodium, at least for preservation purposes, and that the technology changes were gonna be more uh, expensive. Here are some of the uh, uh, views from the industry. Um, the industry acknowledged international trend in reducing sodium and trans fats, uh, but they argue, and, and this is true, most of these agreements were done with the large industry, with international, with the Kraft, Nestle, Bimbos. Uh, and, but they argue that the small and medium-sized businesses, they would not be able to reformulate the process, and therefore they would be facing uh, a, a competition that was not fair, an unfair competition. So the ministries, uh, the, the government, the government side decided, okay, we're gonna uh, do an effort to support the medium and, um, and small size uh, industry so they can reconvert. And uh, in, in the terms, uh, and on all the process of reduced sodium, this is a long process that the Argentinian government have done for years. Uh, this was the a big, uh, uh, agreements with the industry, with the large industry, but, but for many, many years they have been working with the bakeries because uh, something like 25% of all the sodium intakes of the Argentinians, at least these are estimates of the Ministry of Health, come from uh, artisanal breads, the breads you buy in the corner in the bakeries. So for many years they have been working uh, with the bakeries to reconvert to uh, a, on an education process and a training process. And this uh, eventually became uh, the seat for these agreements that are nowadays um, a, a law, a law to reduce sodium in Argentina. So I'm not going to get into more details, it's just an example of what we're trying to look at uh, in the future for obesity prevention uh, policies and strategies. Thank you very much. <laughs>